Rocky and Towns, that's sexy, man. Like, people love reading about it for all the wrong reasons, as far as I'm concerned, because it's about <laughs> getting high and screwed up and, and yeah. wild stories, which they both had. But anybody can be wild. Anybody can be an alcoholic or a drug addict or have mental problems. And very few people can write songs like that. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. The Lone Star Play Podcast is produced by TexasRealFood.com. Find out more at the end of this episode. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. We have an awesome episode today. Uh, I interviewed Brian T. Atkinson. He has a new book out. It's called True Love, Cast Out All Evil, Songwriting Legacy of Rocky Erickson. It's a great book. It'll be out November 15th. Uh, I got a sneak uh, copy of it, so I was able to uh, get a little read on it, and it's awesome. Um, Texas music history, if you're into that, this is a phenomenal book. Um, and the interview with Brian was actually pretty cool. Really enjoyed the guy. Um, we talked a little bit about interviewing. It was sort of meta in a lot of ways because he was asking me some questions and um, I liked it. You know, we didn't just talk about the book. So I like that. And we talked food as well. He's got some great recommendations for food there in Austin. He's in Austin um, for some awesome places, some places I'd never heard of. So that was cool. And he uh, partook in a little food trivia as well. So you can see how Brian did at the end. Uh, I'll give you a hint. He did okay. <laughs> you tell me how he did. See how well you know these questions. Be judging people, okay? Uh, how, how is your food knowledge? Some of them are difficult. Anyway, um, it's an awesome, awesome book. Please check it out when it comes out. We'll put a link down in the uh, description. And... Um, yeah, it's a great interview with Brian T. Atkinson. Um, and of course, talking about Rocky Erickson and the history there and just writing books in general as well. Um, I love having authors on. They really actually are good conversationalists for the most part. A good one should be because they should know how to tell a story, right? So anyway, yeah, great interview. Um, you're going to enjoy it. So before we get to that, um, as always, we got to keep the mics on, okay? So, quick word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food, and we'll be right back. Hi, I wanted to talk to you about other things that are on the Texas Real Food site that are just as amazing as putting in your zip code, finding the best place around you that's serving, you know, all natural, fresh, organic ingredients, all right? There's resources on there reviews, blogs, articles, and most importantly, Texas Real Food recipes. So you can find things on there that really aren't on any other site. I promise you that. And stuff that's pretty standard, but we give it a twist, right? That's the chef way. Something familiar with a twist. So we've got, for instance, cinnamon spiced hot cross buns. You can also find a great Texas strawberry cheesecake recipe. Just amazing stuff. So please check it out at texasrealfood.com. All right, back to the show. And we're back, as always. Uh, can I just say, first of all, thank you so much for listening and watching. I really do appreciate it. I mean that. All of us do here at the Lone Star Plate. We really do appreciate it. So thank you. Um, if you're on social media, please follow us uh, on Instagram, Facebook. Just look us up, Lone Star Plate TX, or just search the Lone Star Plate. Um, that would help us out a lot. We're trying to grow that. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. That helps us out a lot. And the notifications and hit the like and just comment. Tell us your favorite memory about uh, Rocky Erickson. Or maybe you saw him live. Uh, maybe you know something about him. Um, or who else is one of your favorite uh, who, who else is another artist that you feel is sort of, you know, flew under the radar or un, undeserved, right? Like not getting the, the, the attention they deserve. Somebody who's maybe influential in a particular music scene or something. Um, that'd be cool. Who, who else? Throw some, throw some down in the comments for us. All right. 
Let's get to this interview. Brian T. Atkinson, again, this, uh, the name of the book is True Love, Cast Out All Evil, Songwriting Legacy of Rocky Erickson, available November 15th. All right, let's get into this. Enjoy. Hello, how we doing? Hey, good man, how's it going? Great, you hear me okay? Yeah, is this all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, kick your feet up, absolutely. If I could, I would, my table's too tall. Give it a shot, man. It's okay, give it a shot. I'll just fall back out of, out of frame here, just like. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I love that pup there, just taking a nap there. My two dogs are, are laying right here as well. Oh uh, yeah, I just just got him about two weeks ago. He was a day away from being put down. Look at you, man! That is amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it, great job. He was a shelter. He was a street dog in Bastrop, and then uh, he was at the shelter. Didn't have any room. He's one year old. You know, I mean, it's just oh, mind boggling. Yeah. So anyway, totally. Yeah. No, that's great, man. Both the minor rescues. I'm all about. Um, I'm all about rescues, and nothing against people that breed dogs i actually have a couple of friends that do it um but it's just not something i recommend i mean i don't know you know anyway not to get into dogs here hey we can talk about <laughs> dogs as much as you want man it's a <laughs> hey, good segue to two-headed dog you know right right <laughs> absolutely hey listen we talk about everything on the podcast that's for sure i i never uh try to rein things in if things are going a certain way and it's feeling i let it go. i don't have you know i don't worry about that stuff yeah. Um, but let's talk about this book, man. That's why we, we're having you on. You got this um, this phenomenal new book coming out uh, November 15th. I think I have that right. Yep. Cool. November 15th. Tell, tell us a little bit about it. Tell us this title. I love this long title uh, of a book. And, and how did you yeah. come up with that? <laughs> I know. I try so hard to have these punchy short titles and it just did not work. Uh, <laughs> first of all, probably because it's I have two favorite records of his and the, the one called that is one of them and i, I don't know i, I, I just uh, gotten going on the book and doing interviews i just it just sort of represented rocky's personality to me as at least as much as i knew doing this book you know um he, he seemed like a real sweet dude you know he's obviously had some issues um but uh like the friends that I talked to and people actually knew him and there weren't many, but I mean, one, you know, they just kept saying how nice and sweet and generous he was. And, but he dealt with all that evil stuff, you know, all those demons and all of this stuff the songs are about. So that, that title is sort of, I hope represented him overcoming that in some way. True love cast out all evil. Yeah. Right. What a true statement uh, as well. If you believe in that, uh, and hopefully you do. Yeah. Um, you, you as not you personally, but you, the, the listener as well. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so this is, this is basically about Rocky Erickson, right? This entire book, um, yeah. the foreword, uh, by, I saw Henry Rollins and Billy Gibbons, uh, yeah. rest in peace. Um, so uh, yeah. How did this come about? Like you, I, I mean, I'm sure you were a fan, but like, you know, this is a big project. So I'm just curious how you got into this. The the book itself? Um, yeah. Well, I don't, it's kind of interesting, man. I, I, I really didn't know much about Rocky except the general story that everybody who knows music and lives in Texas knows. It's a little bit crazy. Did a lot of acid early on in the elevators and then was kind of a recluse. That's it. And then he, he died on May 31st, 2019. And I, honestly, I don't know why. I just thought, man, that would be a good book. And I looked it up and I, I found a couple books on the elevators or, or books that they're part of. But a couple is a guy, a British guy, Paul Grumman, who's done a couple books on them. And they're big. I mean, there's not a whole lot I need to say about that. So I I looked around. There's like nothing on his solo career. And everything I read was like, you know, Rocky was a part of this pioneering psychedelic rock band, the 13th Floor Elevators, and then wrote some songs after that. But it's like, man, when I got into this stuff, that's what was interesting, interesting to me. So that day I pitched my publisher and he gave the thumbs up. So I just started digging in. Wow. Just like that. So that's how it works. If you, sometimes if you get a book, I mean, how, how, what kind of time commitment, right? Your, your publisher's like just saying yes to this. It's a big time commitment, right? So that's kind of interesting that it just like one conversation can lead to it happening. 
Well, I mean, that, that balances out the ones like this. My the book I'm working on right now is on a folk singer named Nancy Griffith. And it's taken me six months of ba- bouncing things back and forth to get this one right. Uh, and and there are lots of things, too. Like, you know, sometimes you hear someone's hard to work with if they're still alive. And you don't want to, I don't know if you want to get into that. Or, you know, there are issues, lots of issues. Somebody else is working on a book, you know. Um, yeah. I was, I thought, man, I'd run, I'd so run out of ideas trying to find the Nancy one that I pitched a book I never thought I'd do because it's so overdone, but I pitched a Willie Nelson book. And (laughs) my editor, of course, wrote back and said, great idea. Somebody's already doing it for them. (laughs) I'm like, uh, uh, it all happens the way it happens. You know, it took me, took me two years and I think two failed books uh after my first book on Thomas Van Zandt to come up with my second and that's only because my partner Jenny and I um she asked me to write a book about her dad Kent Finley who owns this venue down in San Marcos um Chisholm Street Warehouse and uh I just said yeah let's do it because I couldn't figure out what the hell I was going to write about then I did like Ray Wiley Hubbard and I started getting into a groove after that but uh yeah it's different every book but Rocky yeah it was just kind of dumb luck just because yeah because it, it's interesting that's why my publisher is always looking for something that hasn't been done or there's some new angle and well since there was nothing done on them you know it was pretty op- open season to do whatever the hell i wanted yeah yeah sort of any angle really at that point right because yeah. there's nothing there's nothing there yeah well is that scary to you to go into something that there is nothing you know sort of to reference off or to even like, hey, I'm going to make it better than these. You know, you're sort of pioneering this book in, in a lot of ways, right? Being the first one to really put this out. So does that scare you? Or are you more looking forward to that? Because you could sort of lay the groundwork. Uh, both. I mean, I, I'd say that for any version of that question you asked, because if yeah. I did, if I had a Willie book, it's like, how can I possibly say anything new about yeah. Willie? And, and then Rocky, it's like, yeah, it's almost a little more difficult because I'm good getting through things and figuring something out, but when there's a blank canvas and I can, my mind goes too many places and I think, <laughs> all right, let's do this angle. Let's do that angle. Oh, we can do all of them. Oh, we can't do any of them. Oh, that one's going to crap out, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's always kind of terrifying. It's, it's terrifying to look at a, a blank page of the next book after you finished one and you have that like euphoric, I did a book and it's like, well, it doesn't matter now, man, you're, ground zero again (laughs) but so i usually do like um 75 80 interviews i mean i usually do about 85 or 90 but that many make it in the book and uh yeah it's somewhere around like somewhere around like 45 to 50 is where it starts going that other way that you were saying where it's just like oh this is kind of cool i get to now like figure out exactly what i'm going to do and then I make a list of who I want in what section. And then you see like, okay, there's five people in this section and 12 in this one. So I got to fill out that one, to get seven more interviews. And you, when you really start getting in there and seeing what you need to fill in just to finish the book, then it's fun as hell, man. It's it, but sure. getting there is pretty rough, but it's fun yeah. after that. And I once love you lay, once you lay the blueprints a little bit. Down yeah, to what you're gonna do? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's fun to do. Like when I did my first book on Towns, I did it because he's my man. He's my favorite songwriter, probably always will be. Uh, and I knew about anything I needed to know going into the book, and I thought that was how you did books. But I found <laughs> that it's more interesting to me to be a little ignorant going in, so I can study and learn, and like the whole story is fresh to me. You know, I and see, that was I see, that I was see. rocky, and I had to dig for some of these people to talk to. But honestly, I'm kind of like old and in the way as far as this thing goes. Like I had to ask friends who were younger about people that had been influenced, and it was just not in my wheelhouse. And uh, <laughs> we got a guy named Chris Fullerton on our on our record label who is a massive fan, and he's in his mid 30s. So I was constantly like texting him, like, "Hey, have you heard of this guy?" And he's like, "Dude, he's my hero." Like he, he'd be like, oh yeah, you're talking to him today. I'm like, yeah, is that cool? He's like, oh, can you can you play that tape for me? I'm like, yeah, sure, man. I don't. And it, so it's kind of nice and freeing that way too, because there's no pressure. Like, you know, I'm I just ask stuff and they answer, and it's all cool. I don't even know if I missed it. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, how, how do typically like these interviews go for, for books? Is it just like, you know, sitting down for some coffee? Are you, you know, are you happy to just call somebody on the phone? Do you prefer to see them? Is it different with every person? Uh, it's usually on the phone just cause like Rocky, I was talking to people in like Portugal and Spain. Yeah. I, just gotta make sure your calling plan works you know that's pretty much the deal but <laughs> uh i like i prefer doing in person but it's a lot easier recording wise uh because i know you're going to don't laugh too much at me but i still record this stuff on cassette tapes and i love that I because love that. uh i have all my stuff archived down at texas state at the whitliff collections and I apologized when I was dumping off tapes one time and they said, no, we prefer that. Then we digitize it. And then, so I just keep doing it. Uh, I'm going to get, I'm going to forget what you just asked me there for a second. Cause I have a question for you real quick. Like, cause I have been thinking about doing the zoom thing and is, do you find it easy to like, it, it just saves your computer and then yeah. you, you, yeah. you play it and you can stop, start rewind and stuff, everything. Yeah, it saves the files directly to however you set it up, either in the cloud or directly on your computer or a mix of both. And yeah. it'll bre break down the audio files and video files. Now, I do separate video as well that you can't see from here mm -hmm. on top. Like I have another camera recording this, you know, se separately to give me a, a different quality. So like this yeah. image that you're seeing is not the final image for myself, but other than that, I mean, if you're you're really just getting notes and stuff, so right, like you'll have the conversation recorded, so and you'll have video and audio. Yeah, it works great, man. It it, it huh. it'll do uh, uh, one you know, one person unlimited. So you can talk to one person unlimited time, but if you want to have like conversations with two people or more yeah. for more than forty five minutes, you have to pay. Oh, okay. How much? That makes it? sense. Mm -hmm. It's like. 15 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, oh, okay. something, something like that. You know, yeah, we, we cool. have some like, you know, pro business plan or something on the zoom for, for this. So we can just record unlimited everything and, and all that stuff. So anyway, yeah. cool. Uh, well, but the, the, the question I had asked was just, you know, how, how you'd like to record the interviews. I mean, that's, I'm just curious how those type of, cause that's a lot of interviews to do for a book. And I know authors have to go, I've interviewed a lot of authors. I know they have to do, there's a lot of groundwork to get done. And yeah. I, I, can't, I just can't imagine having to knock out like 90 interviews. That sounds like, I mean, I guess you're very specific with them. You're not like having an actual interview where you're getting their whole life story from them or you sort of let them control the conversation. I mean, how does that? Uh, I'm not really good at giving up control, but uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I'd like to just have a conversation. You know, and it took a long time to get there. I mean, I've been doing this for like 20 something years. And and yeah. when you're younger, you got your bullet point list of 10 questions and you get all like, oh, God, I got to get down to number seven at least. And like, yeah, yeah. I, and after a point, we just get completely comfortable talking to people, no matter if it's Keith Richards or like Shelly King. Uh, sure. You know, I just sort of like to bullshit, you know, and and, and stay on the topic. You know, I mean, we're talking about Rocky, but like, it's sort of like you said with what you're doing here. Like, if I start talking to some dude and I wanted to ask about that song he played on, but he really wants to talk about that uh, that uh, quesadilla played at Jovita's that they had in eight, in '88 when Rocky had this conversation with so and so, you just roll, you know. And yeah. if you forget about that song, you either check back with him later and say, "Oh crap, I forgot to ask this," or you just kind of let it. Sometimes you just gotta let it go, man. And yeah. And that way you also get more unique stuff. Like if you do the bullet point thing, you're going to get 90 people talking about, you know, a two headed dog or whatever that, you know, that, that people know about. So you just, yeah. So I guess I'm, the answer is I, I control it, but I let it go. So I kind of ease up a little. Yeah, absolutely. You're just trying to get the best material you can. However, mm -hmm. that is, e even if it's something you decided upon asking or just some nugget they like you said they start throwing out they start talking about something why stop them could be something you never heard before um for sure no that's yeah nice. the, the best interviews easily are the ones where you ask your first question and then don't ask anything else that you prepared you know? <laughs> yeah yeah i i completely agree man yeah you're just going back and forth 
it's interesting to watch people talk or listen to people talk you know it's like but it's not if you're too starchy I'm like <laughs> Oh, for sure. Uh, well, that's sort of like this whole new medium of podcasts, right? That's out like mm -hmm. um, th this whole idea of having the conversation and long form conversations. I mean, how long I, I was curious about this. How long of a podcast will you listen to? Uh, I always accuse the readers of having a short attention span, but I'm a reader, too, man. I. <laughs> I have to be really interested and but that's the thing I mean I think most people are if they're going to a podcast they probably are interested in the person doing it or the topic yeah and so yeah I would say I mean yours right around an hour right yeah that's that's about that's pretty good you know I will commit for an hour I'm probably not going to because that's going to interfere with my day unless I pause it and go back or something but like sure. an hour is good half an hour might be a little too short even depending on what the topic is and what you're you know stuff like this where you're like zo zoned in on one topic an hour is probably good what about you do you do you listen to a lot of podcasts or just do a, this i you know i listen to a few but not the whole thing i sort of like watch clips and stuff yeah. on youtube i mean that's how i take in a lot of podcasts just sort of clips of it and and things like that which is why we do a lot of clips ourselves uh for this podcast just because i feel like that's how a lot of people take them in but we've definitely done some like quote unquote epic podcast where they've been three hours long you okay. know and they've been long man like you know i did one with dale hansen um pretty recently and that went for three hours and he would have talked longer but his ipad died and i was like it was a great conversation i mean i'm not gonna lie i was into it the whole time i love talking to people but it just seemed like that's that's a long we broke it down into two episodes. Um, I just let people talk like if there's cool talking and we're still going and it doesn't seem dry, I'll let it keep going. Yeah, to be honest with I can always edit it down, I guess. Right. That's how I sort of look at it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I try not to set too many rules, try to just take the situation as it comes, sort of like yourself and just sort of adapt to it and and roll with it you know i can get a sense of things but you know anyway i'll tell you what man this just came to my head when you say it could go on forever if you ever want to just sit there and listen to some dude go line up an interview with the guy who is the head like the songwriter and the main dude for the trans-siberian orchestra okay I, I interviewed him one time for the statesman here when i was freelancing for him and i'm not kidding you i i said hello <laughs> and ex exactly i i checked my phone when i hung up exactly 59 minutes and 59 seconds later he said goodbye and everything in between was uh, all kinds of stuff about the pyrotechnics and this but he just kept like he was off like i didn't even have to be there i could have been taking a nap and come back again <laughs> you know, it's like just if you want to do that sometime and you want to <laughs> I don't know how, how absolutely be, but yeah I, I mean who knows uh you, you never know till you till you do it uh, people will say hey why don't you get this person on the podcast do this do, you know would that be cool I don't know I don't know if it'd be cool until I get them in front of me to be honest with you I never know till the person's in front if it's if it's going to work out or not and even past that point I, I don't really judge the podcast afterwards I don't watch them yeah. afterwards so I don't you know was it good or not i don't know that's objective right i mean you know how, how, you get I, a feel i mean i'm curious i saw that yeah, you got so. i saw that you had uh, james mcbertry on yeah uh, a while back and jenny manages him so i i'm right in that world all, all the time but i'm just curious how that went because he i think he's you know it's it's interesting i've interviewed him a ton over the years and it's changed as i've kind of grown up and then he's kind of learned to give more lengthy responses i guess like how'd that go wow that's a great um th that's a great question actually because that's exact I, i've interviewed him twice actually mm -hmm. and yes that's i didn't know that about him to be honest with you so i went into it just you know ready to go and yes yeah, so the very first interview was very like it, it took a lot for me to get out of him but people were commenting on youtube that that was like one of the longest interviews he had done and i was like okay and then we did this this last one and people loved it. They were like, wow, how'd you get him to open up? You know, this what'd you was talk great. About? What, what'd you, you know, politics, some stuff he wanted to talk about. I sort of let it go that way. I mean, we talked about his new album and 
And we got into that. I gave my condolences about his father, uh, you know, influence of that, uh, like how, how much that affected this new album. And he mm. sang uh, he sang a couple songs. And yeah, I kind of let him sort of direct the conversation. What I saw him getting, you know, excited about, he make a comment on, I would just dive deeper into that. So it was really more just, I think, finding what he wanted to talk about. And that's just with a lot of people. They're more willing to give and go further if they're, you know, excited and passionate about what they're talking about. I mean, it just makes sense. Um, yeah. Well, the key with that kind of thing, like, you know, for me at least is finding out immediately who wants to talk about their, what they made or who doesn't like James doesn't usually like to talk about songwriting and stuff too much. Or like, that's crap. a good point. And, yeah, that's and, a good but point. If, and if you ask him, you know, what gun he's using going hunting, you know, he'll go on for half an hour. Yeah. And that's great. a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. It's like when I have Bob Schneider on, he never really wants to talk about the music. He yeah. always wants to just talk about shows he's watching, TV, movies he's seen, um, yeah. uh, whatever kind of random. Those are uh, those are other podcasts that go for two and a half hours with Bob when I do them with Bob. I think I've had I think I've interviewed Bob four times now. Mm -hmm. they, oh, they are they are long podcasts for sure. You know, we we get going, but I, you know, yeah. again, I always feel like you can edit it down, so I don't. I don't see the point in stopping it. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, let's let's dig into this book a little bit more, man. Um, I guess I'm just curious, like, wh what is the expectation for for this book for you? For, let's let's say for you personally, not not your publisher, not any other outside pressure, but just just for yourself. Uh, the expectation. Well, I mean, I try not to have too many because you get disappointed doing books, man. <laughs> uh, but I would say my goal with every book is just, I want to find somebody that I think is, you know, historically significant, usually someone no one knows about if, if I'm lucky and I get to document their, their story. I don't really, I never really cared much about, you know, like straight biographies as far as like how you grew up, who you married, any of that, unless it affects the songs, but it's, if songs were written about your mother, which is the case with Rocky or your family, then I'm, then I care. And I'll want to get into that. But like, I just want their art to be in a library, you know? And that's the thing that I love about Texas A&M university press is like, as opposed to going with a commercial publisher who will give you this big promotional push and then dump your book after a certain, however long it won't go back in print. A&M keeps it in print basically until the whole ball goes up in flames, you know? And oh wow! so I, I, that's why I do that and why we produce tribute records and stuff. And like, just to have that, ha have it documented that that person's life was important enough for someone to sit down for a year and chronicle what they gave to the world, you know? Yeah. As, I mean, if you, if you start thinking about expectations as far as sales and stuff, you know, you're going to, you always have like, a pretty good idea like i just did a book on mickey newberry it came out like in the spring i guess and i knew it wasn't gonna sell like hot cakes it's an important story he wrote so many hit songs that nobody knows he wrote and like were big hits for people in the 60s 70s and 80s but i just knew you know he's not a he's not sexy he wasn't you know he drank he smoked pot sometimes but he wasn't like Rocky and Towns, that's sexy, man. Like people love reading about it for all the wrong reasons, as far as I'm concerned, because it's about <laughs> getting high and screwed up and, and yeah. wild stories, which they both had. But anybody can be wild. Anybody can be an alcoholic or a drug addict or have mental problems. And very few people can write songs like them. So like, I just want that to be somewhere that people, you know, I always say like, I want I want me in the future. Like I had a friend give me in grad school, give me two towns, uh, Steve Earle CDs. And on one of the CDs at the end was a song called uh, Tecumseh Valley. And I thought it was the best story song I'd ever heard in my life. And it said T Van Zandt. So I did some research and I found out Towns Van Zandt. So I went to the library in Iowa City and I found like six towns CDs and it I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it literally changed my life. I was listening to the doors and the stones and the stuff you're raised on, like Van Halen. And I just didn't know anything about this music. 
and uh, someone who wrote like a poet, you know, and like I was studying writing at the time and, and getting all these big thoughts about how important, you know, we all are is doing this in which you, the more books you do, the more you realize that is not the case, but, <laughs> uh, but I want that. I want, I'm doing it for that dude, you know, like who just finds like a Rocky Erickson book and is like, I swear to God, I heard that name once when, when my buddy George was listening to Janis Joplin, like what's going on here? And it's like, holy crap. You know, I don't need to change people's lives. That's a bit dramatic, but like just one dude who can go down a path. Like I started my whole career because my buddy Jason gave me a CD he thought I'd like, because I like the Beatles and the Stones, you know, and that's about as lofty as I can get, man, is, is helping one person. And if it's more than that, if I sell some copies, great. Cause you know, I, it's nice to buy some new trees for the lawn or whatever, but like, <laughs> whatever, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. No, oh, that sounds reasonable. That sounds, uh, that sounds completely reasonable. Well, they always say like, right. You perform for one person. I guess you probably write for one person maybe or something, right? Like uh, that idea. No, no, I get it. Um, what, what do you think's the most impactful, part of this book that that might uh you know make someone give a double take or i don't know if that's the best way to to ask that no i know what, you're, what you mean i don't that's a good question i mean i what would I make you do a double take I, that's the thing like the stuff that makes people do double takes is the part that's known yeah so i don't know that i'm gonna do that unless somebody reads it and goes wow there's actually was more substance behind that craziness than i thought but not a lot of people think that way you know they want the wild stories uh sure so i don't know if there anybody's gonna really double take but you know one of the guys who reviewed this book for the publisher you have to pass two peer reviews to move on in the process and, and i don't know if i'm allowed to say who it was but he's a basically like a big time rocky scholar and he, he, I got my review back and he said, you know, this is a dude who knows literally everything there is to know. He knew Rocky, everything. And he said, this book blew my mind because of the, like, whatever, there are 80 interviews, like 62 of them are completely new material. Oh, wow. And that's the thing. So that's where I, I guess I'm answering your question maybe is that, and I, I started that with my town's book by accident when I was doing that, but it's like, getting the other voices yeah you know like you get the ones you have to it's like the beginning of this book there's a bit on the elevators because you, you can't you just can't do a rocky erickson book without mentioning the elevators right sure so it's sort of just like a you pick up at the tail end of the story they're crashing and burning where all the other books lead up to that so i didn't know that going into the book at all but that's kind of how it all played out and so it's like elevators crash and burn rocky goes gets locked away in the Rusk mental institution for three years, goes through stuff I can't even imagine, man. I mean, like, I, 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 this is kind of, I'm going on like hearsay that people told me, like, you know, they would bring drugs in and he'd do acid in the mental institution and then they give him electroshock while he was tripping. Oh my God. I don't know, I, I don't know. I mean, people say that, so I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna say it's true, but, enough people say stuff like that i do know obviously everybody knows that knows the story he went through a lot of electroshock therapy and that's i just can't imagine man I, I just can't i don't know much except what i've seen and read like and i've seen some stuff on tv and youtube and and it looks pretty brutal oh it sounds, it's horrible i mean it sounds horrible i don't even know why we ever did that I, do we still do that now yeah but there's yeah i i think there's a much milder version you know instead of like like you see those god-awful movies like cuckoo's nest or whatever when they have like the shock things yeah and yeah put, exactly. them in, put them in water or something and get them yeah in, i think not i don't know anything really so this is just my guess it's more of a, like a you know refined the technology is more like a laser or something it's not like this thing sending you know like sticking your finger in a socket like it was yeah like, yeah i i see what you're saying i think yeah, that's, that's crazy that, but that's uh, crazy yeah that and sounds I, antiquated uh oh, it just sounds i mean i can't so medieval anyway, yeah it sounds medieval but, right so he goes through that you know and it's like you come out the flip side i can't imagine being anywhere near normal on the flip side of that you know yeah or happy really you know i yeah. mean like how how can you be happy with a world where somebody did that to you? Absolutely. 
you know and now is one of the things like the this this woman clementine hall who was married to tommy hall who is like the brains of the elevators was great she was so sweet i talked to her a bunch of times and um one of the things she says in the book i know is like it's amazing that he came out of rusk and survived and came out such a sweet guy still like he was all screwed up in the head but he still was just a, a nice guy you know yeah and she said i don't know many people who can do that so there's like and going back to the title it's sort of like a testament to like how he can survive this wicked crap and still kind of be like hey what's not what's going on guys you know go do whatever tonight you know and not be like you know fuck the system fuck the man all that yeah. you know it's just like anyway yeah become bitter and and angry yeah. and yeah yeah for sure Wh which happens to people without any of that oh yeah right right like to <clears throat> to go down that path so yeah for sure do you think like just the music business in general just sort of lends itself to you know people with sort of problems right some whether it be addiction problems or mental problems you know our artistry as a as it were you know that's like the the question you know and and i don't have an answer for it you know steve earl always said he was a you know massive heroin junkie for a long time and and cleaned up a while you know 20 years ago but he always says like i didn't you know i didn't have to be a heroin addict to be a songwriter i would have been a songwriter but there is <laughs> yeah. something about that yeah. personality type because rocky's a perfect example because i i don't get the idea that he was tripping when he took a lot of acid necessarily to get high and do crazy crap or whatever he was doing it more as a spiritual experience you know and he was trying to open doors like a lot of people were in the late 60s sure and that kind of personality where you're just a curious person and you're always searching for stuff and you want more out of life than a nine to five job and that tends to be someone who would write or paint or do songs or any most art you know you're 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 creative you think outside the box and a lot of people like to smoke some pot or drink or take, get high on you know acid or whatever it's just the kind of i don't think you need one for the other but they go along they go together a whole lot <laughs> absolutely i mean i played music for a little bit um back in my early 20s and i mean it's definitely around it's part of it's sort of just part of the lore yeah. of you know hanging out and drinking and you know doing drugs and doing music and some people think that's the only way to get to their music is through through those avenues some people um which doesn't end well usually right uh for artists like that um no I I I, I totally bought the Jim Morrison Towns Hunter Thompson whatever like theory in my early 20s and at one point I just kind of <laughs> I decided that it was such a freaking cliche to do that and it's like I still I like wine man I like beer but like when I read back through some of my notebooks when I was being the genius man they sucked <laughs> it was bad and it's like totally. okay when I did that starting in like my late 20s early 30s it was like okay you know you can read over your stuff when you're drinking but don't be writing it like when I was right it's like your thoughts are so massive and great and then not so much later on you know it's like <laughs> they're just stupid so that's and that's funny. the thing like I don't get the idea that Rocky was you know tripping and writing songs he maybe trip and then you know write the song the next day when he was sobered up yeah you get, it's, it's important I think to do whatever you want to do and have the experience you know you have the experience and then you write about it when you can think straight sure yeah. absolutely i i read about an author who said um he smoked weed i, I think his name's andrew sullivan I, i'm not 100 percent sure if that that's yeah. who it was I, I was watching bill maher is you know just some random comment but i liked it it made sense he said um he said i don't smoke w pot while i write never because it's like you said it's not going to come out but what i do do is after i write something i review it i smoke a little weed and, and read it and review it and kind of yeah. take it in and it sort of lets me see it from another angle i might you know because you're writing your words of your babies and you you know sometimes it's hard to get rid of them and it made it easier for him to edit himself i guess 
uh, which I thought, okay, that makes sense. He's got a he's got a a, a way, of, you know, his way of 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 utilizing it uh, to, to you know some sort of creative uh, outlet. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I There's guess all teach, kinds of things. Their own. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I I when I read something I wrote with two glasses of wine in me, it's going to read totally different, and I see things. It's I think I think it's now a pretty decent way to edit, like you're saying. Or at least see something different to make a note so you can yeah exactly kind of change it the next day yeah um but it's all kinds of stuff just because i'm i don't know why but i'm really visual like i a paragraph has to look the right shape to me for whatever reason or oh, i like that online it's annoying <laughs> it's annoying but it's like <laughs> i don't understand it but um you know sometimes when i'm editing something i have two email servers and i'll and i'll copy it from my document in one and edit in there and put it back in the document and then put it in the other email that has a different font and i see things that i never saw you know in the 15 times i edited before just because the font changed it's oh weird. that's interesting i'm gonna start i'm gonna try that actually change the font and it's see it's really weird and it's bizarre like words just look different or you think yeah. oh, that doesn't fit there so well or you know whatever i didn't but that makes sense. Me. I mean, that totally makes sense. Um, when I'm doing, you know, not that I do a lot of stuff, but just amateur graphic design stuff for Photoshop, whatever, something for the podcast or something I want to do. Yeah. The font, font's a big deal, you know. Mm -hmm. It can totally change a phrase, how it looks, you know. It, it sets a tone. Uh, it could totally take, you know, change the meaning of it. So, I, to you know, it totally makes sense you're going to see it differently. I mean, I'm all about that. I I'm all about doing something and then taking a look at it through a different lens to see is it is it as great as i thought it was not usually you know? but sometimes. it never is right it never it, yeah. <laughs> it never it never is when i first started smoking pot i thought every song i wrote was the greatest thing in the world you oh, know? yeah I, I, that's literally what i thought I, I thought this is the greatest thing in the world like you said you go back years later and you're looking at stuff you're just like what is wrong with me what does what why did i think this was yeah worth, worth saving well, so you were probably in what, like your twenties at that point, like early twenties. Absolutely, I'm forty. I'm forty-one now. Exactly, I was in my early twenties. You know, I was like twenty-two. Come on, it's a yeah, story. Yeah. Story that's been told. Uh, we all got to go through many it, times. Yeah, you go through it. You grow up, move on, and hopefully, you're still interested in this when you're not so screwed up. You know, and. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I wish I was as good as I thought I was back then. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy i was I, i'm helping a friend out with a book and i was just saying the same thing it's like you know she said she went into the book really confident and, yeah. um, and she's about finished with it now and she she questions everything and she's not she's lost her self-confidence and i said that's awesome that's how it works you know you, the more you learn yes the more you question everything you do and the more you it's like traveling the more you see the more questions you have and the more your your mind just yeah. kind of goes everywhere but it, I hate using this word, but it's it's humbling. It's, it's like it's just like man. That's why I write a book for one dude to find. You know, I wrote my town's book, and I'm thinking this is going to sell fifty thousand copies and whatever. I'm going to show the world this the genius that I discovered. Well, no, I did, and so <laughs> you know, the, and you do a few of those, and it's like, well, I still love doing this. This is what I'm here to do, man. I love talking to people and doing these interviews about something I'm interested in. Yeah. It's a pretty good life, but I'm not going to, you know, be top in the New York Times bestsellers. Probably. I mean, you never know. But, uh, you know, yeah. I, would, I would have also said two years ago, no one's ever going to know who Blaze Foley is. And then Ethan Hawke does this movie about him, you know, yeah. and it's like, Blaze, wow, man, that drunk dude who was, uh, you know, like who followed towns around and looked drunker than him like like and wrote uh, a couple good, great songs i think oh and I, i'm not a huge fan of this stuff but it's just like that dude now ethan freaking hawk made a movie about him so you never know maybe somebody will option this and get all the dialogue have people talking in a movie someday you never i mean you just know you just don't know right i mean that is true. Do. Yeah. yeah absolutely of course of yeah. course i mean there's there's no question i mean w would you so you would like to see this maybe optioned for something else for them to take this story 
Well, my accountant that. sure would. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie to you and say I don't want to make any money. It's just that I don't make much money. You know, it's hard to, right. it's a hard world right now, especially, you know, I'm, I'm doing a couple of the things that really don't have much traction. I write books and I produce records and I have a record label and none of these are really necessary. You know, it's like, I mean, you write the book, but you know, people are going to get a Kindle or whatever. People are going to get my, the music we produce off Spotify. And it's really frustrating, man. Cause every once in a while, when I want to torture myself, I'll take the numbers that we get in like sales for the label and sort of translate it into like 1972 terms and what we would make if people were paying like five bucks for that single. Yeah. It would be a different, it is a different world. I mean, it's just like, how can that possibly be, you know, like, how am I making that little off of something, all these people, like, I'm actually doing my dream, but it is, yeah. it still is like living the dream, which is why it's totally worth it. It's, it, there, it. Everything's great about it, except the world shifted with technology. And I mean, this is an old discussion already, but all the rights owners to everything got screwed, you know, and I don't. It is what it is. Songwriters don't make much money. You know, you got option. You got to place your stuff on TV or movies, and you know, we happen to get a uh, a theme song for this like cable. Some I don't even know what network. Oh, it's on the Velocity Network. It's like a car thing. Okay. And we got one of the songs on one of our records got picked for the title for the title track. Yeah. And, uh, the theme song and. It's like, I see there might be some money in that, but like, it's tough. That was just coincidence, you know? And so anyway, um, yeah. No, no, I, I, I can't even imagine um, having to catch up to everything that's happening um, in the music business. And I know touring was a big, playing live was a big part of people's incomes as well, which is why, yeah. at least through my podcast interviews, learning that the, you know, the pandemic was quite, you know, destabilizing for for a lot of artists um who weren't able to pay their band for instance or something you know like maybe they were they were okay but like oh man how, how am i supposed to take care of my band not going out on the road and you know doing these things so yeah i mean the whole scene has changed and i can't even imagine trying to keep up to, well that to i mean yeah they make i mean it's the majority of the money for people in the music i'm hanging around like james you know for yeah instance, like and so it's a lot of like the pandemic has really shown, I think a lot of people really had a spitball, first of all, and just like yeah. figure out what the hell. It's like there's yeah. no, there's nothing, literally nothing's happening. And when you got to make some money, you got to make a living. Yeah. So then the stream, I mean, doing stuff online was happening, but like even stuff like when we produce records, we've been trying to have James' band come in just so we, we can pay him to be the band on some tracks, you know, and then they, they do other jobs too. And it's like, just kind of winging it. Really. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. I mean, people, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, again, uh, I'm in the restaurant industry and, or at least I was for, for many years before this podcast. And I got out right, literally right before, you know, the pandemic essentially. And, I can't even imagine having to have gone through this pandemic, like yeah. in the, working in restaurants. There's just no way. I mean, all my friends' horror stories over the last 18 months has been um, horrific. It's already a tough industry, like the music industry. Like it's already a tough industry, you know, by itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you throw this on top of it, it's just like, oh my well, god. I'll tell you this, man. I, I don't know the name, who this was, and what restaurant they work for so i'll just tell you the story because i won't get anybody in trouble but <laughs> like <laughs> at, like like maybe six or eight months into it people were getting so desperate around here that jenny called me one day and said hey you got to come over right now we're going to south park meadows which is this mall down by where she lives and i got over there so what's going on and she said they're selling like like 12 packs of steaks for six bucks like big you know like new york strip steaks I'm like what the, what's going on and she goes i don't know but like there's two tents set up and there's one with chicken and one with steaks so we go down there and there's two tents one with chicken one that huge coolers full of stuff and found out it's a bunch of people who worked at this restaurant and they all got laid off and i guess there wasn't a good relationship with them in the box so they emptied the freaking coolers at work took the crap sold it 
for pennies to make anything, you know, just to make something. Oh. Wow. I, wow. I'm flabbergasted. I'm not going to lie. Always treat I'm your little, staff well, man. <laughs> well, that's a hundred percent, a hundred percent true. Shout out to all the Boca crew that used to work at my place, my place in Austin. Uh, I took care of all my employees for sure. Um, 100%. Where was it? Where, 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 uh, I, I, I had a few locations. So I was on, uh, and I moved different times, I had a food truck. So I was on Lamar and Barton Springs behind Tom's Market yeah. for, for like the first year and a half. Then I moved to Rainy Street for a little over two years. That That's where we were mainly on Rainy You're Street. You're hip. You're real hip, man. We were. The Rainy Street was, was legit. That's uh, yeah. changed the game for sure. That was the, you know. T took the business to another level for sure why'd you get out just the hours the bit you know the long you have no life in the restaurant industry that that's yeah. the, that's the gist you know you help every this is what we say you help everyone else celebrate everything yeah. and you don't get to celebrate really anything right you know I, I i never i never celebrated new year's for like 15 years you know or christmas or thanksgiving or <clears throat> shit or my own birthday like you know, you just constantly, uh, and of, of course, when you're the owner, it's just a lot of work and a lot of time and energy and what I was just done with it, man. I don't know. I just got burnt out on just like any industry. I'm sure it happens to musicians, authors, right? Writers. I mean, right. Like I just got burnt out on it. And I, and I love what I do now, you know, doing this podcast, you know, we're almost yeah. two years in. I, I hope this goes on forever to be honest with you. Yeah. What's well, all yeah. like, uh, I worked in newspapers and magazines for a long time. And when you, you know, on deadlines and stuff, I mean, the news never stops. There's news yeah. Christmas day. I mean, there's, there's something to write about Christmas day, you know, and that's yeah. just the way it goes. And I got yeah. used to that. So it's sort of like a luxury to be able to sit around and write books. Sure. And I, and, I mean, there are deadlines. I give myself deadlines. It's the only way I can work, but uh, you know, it's a lot more laid back than. Absolutely. You know, that that's how I feel about this. Just much more, yeah. you know, laid back. And I still get to work with food, you know, still deal with food a lot. And cause that's still my passion or whatever, but, um, yeah, anyway, um, look, I thought we would, um, before we go here, yeah. um, one, we're going to put all the links to the book and everything at the, I do like cool. an intro and I'll introduce it. We'll have all the links in the description, all that stuff. So, so don't worry <laughs> about any of that stuff. Um, but what we, we've been doing, uh, recently a little bit of food trivia with some of our guests. I don't know. Would you be interested in answering some food trivia? See how well you do. I'll give it a shot, man. I can no guarantees, but we'll see what happens. That's the best answer you could have right there. All right. Sorry about that ding. I'm getting texts. Uh, no, can please, please. Yeah. yeah, I can hear it. Uh, okay. I, it, it, uh, I don't, I don't worry well, about well, it. I had yeah, somebody answer. I had somebody answer a phone call on the podcast one time. I told him to. I told him to. The the phone was ringing. I said, "Answer it. Screw it. Let's see who it is." You know, put him on. <laughs> one time, let me get this story right about James. Jenny was telling me one time he was on a live radio show, and they were about they were on the way to the gig, and they were pulling pull up to a fast food restaurant and ordering at the drive in, <laughs> and the guy calls me said, "Hello." The guy said, "Hey, James, how's it going?" And, and next thing you hear on the radio is, "Yeah, uh, two hamburgers, large fries." And <laughs> That's James, man. <laughs> anyway, yeah, shoot. What, what, so you want to talk about like uh, uh, food trivia oh, itself listen. or like about restaurants or what? No, no, you'll you'll get the head. It's just general food trivia. Nothing crazy. Yeah. Uh, you know, past few guests have done it. Um, everyone's done pretty decent, to be honest with you. Nothing too hard. That's pressure, man. Don't put pressure on me. Let's just see. Let's just see how how well how how much of a foodie are you on a scale of one to ten? Let's just let's get a general idea of where you're at. Um. I don't know, six or seven. I mean, I love cooking and I I do that uh master class. You know, do you know anything about master yeah. class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we had some... Aaron Franklin on uh pretty recently. I saw that. Yeah, yeah he so talked I watched, about that. I watched his there there's this guy, um uh, Italian dude who's wild. I love him. His name is Massimo Boturo. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. um my favorite though, I have two favorites. One's uh Yotem Ottolenghi, who yeah. has restaurants in London and I think a lot of other places, but and the one that is my very favorite blows my mind because he's the most like uptight of all. Like, like Botoro is just like he's wild, man. He's making these like Jackson Pollock like dishes. <laughs> but Thomas Keller, 
who has restaurants in Napa Valley is like real buttoned up and everything, but he knows he's so smart and he gives oh. a crap about food so much that yes, I just, I learn, I learn stuff all the time, you know, and yeah. I, I rewatch his classes over and over and I, I kind of forget over time, but I still, <laughs> you know, remember. And I say, Oh man, yeah, that's, that's great. I need to or get that knife or whatever, but yeah, shoot yeah. away. No, Thomas Keller is a legend. He's, uh, yeah. you know, w w one of the best for sure. Uh, quick, quick trivia. Well, quick fun fact about the Aaron Franklin masterclass. He revealed yeah. on our podcast. He he wing he made up the whole thing on the spot. Huh? He didn't. He didn't. He just made it. That's didn't the have way any, to do it. Man. That's ballsy. Yeah. He he just said, "Look, I've been doing this forever. Like I know what I'm doing. Like I I just showed up at five a.m." and wing the whole entire thing i didn't have any notes nothing i just winged it i was like wow okay great only well, you could do that and it's amazing yeah. too i'll bet you could do it man i mean you know food you know restaurants if, if it's something i know about yeah for sure yeah. i get i get what he was saying like 100 yeah. percent. you know if, if i had to do something about spanish food because that's what my my food truck was about spanish food yeah mm -hmm. dude I, what would i study i already know i like what, what am i gonna prepare i you know i, you I guess know, I'm a, um, an outline you, you know, uh, Gab I, I get her name wrong, but it's something like Gabriella Camera. I don't know. No, it doesn't she's, sound familiar. She, she has a she has restaurants in Mexico City, but she has a master class. I was just wondering if. Oh, right on. No, yeah. I should check her out. God, there's so yeah. many chefs and master class. Like it blew up. Like it's food. Yeah. Food is such a big thing now, right? Like it's this huge. It's a huge thing now, which I love, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's 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 gotten people more into food and expanding their palates. So as as uh, people that cook. That's what you want. People are a little more adventurous. All right, let's jump into this. Here we go. Yeah. yeah uh, top number one question. Well, not the number one, but the first question. Here we go. What are the top two most popular spices in the world? Jesus, man. <laughs> Am I going to know this or is it something yeah. random? No, they're not random spices. Spices. I mean, I'm going to say coriander for one. Okay. No, I'm assuming that's wrong because I just don't. I would. I don't know what in the world. Uh, and uh, I'm stuck in the seas like cumin. I don't know what. <laughs> not bad. I mean, I both of those are great spices. It's uh, I know pepper. It's, more it, it's uh, not. It's pepper and mustard. Oh, that pepper was, and mustard. Yeah, it's easier than it's, mustard thinking, seeds. Thinking too yeah, hard. Yeah. You think it too hard. Although uh, cumin is probably up there because that is a very uh, highly used spice. But in all cook, I know in Mediterranean and then in Mexican, like Spanish, probably too, right? A hundred percent. Cumin yeah. is used a lot. And coriander is too, but not as much. People yeah. will use cilantro instead. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. What percentage of peanuts is found in a standard jar of peanut butter? This will probably what percentage of the peanut butter is is peanuts? Is that... Exactly. Oh geez. And it's a law. So like for them to call it peanut butter, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it, it has to have a, a certain percentage. I don't know. I'm probably wrong with 4%. What, yeah, way off. What is it? It's 90%. Holy crap. So you can feel confident in a nice jar of peanut butter. It, it will have 90% peanuts. Huh. Well, that's, that's, sounds better than 4%. I'm yeah. <laughs> I guess I have well, no faith, man. In those. <laughs> you do. I get it, though. Trust me. You're not. You know, there's a lot of uh, lying in the food industry, as we say, uh, yeah. for sure. When it comes to that, uh, organic being the first one. Um, okay. What is used to make hummus? You ever had hummus before? I love hummus. Yeah. What What's used to make it? Uh, yeah. Chickpeas, uh, tahini, uh, olive oil, garlic. I mean, it's one of those things. It's like salsa. You make it how you want to make it, but like, yeah, uh, that's your. No, base, that's it. Think, yeah, right? yeah. I, I mean, I was just looking for chickpeas, but you gave you actually gave that that is the ingredients to make hummus. Actually, the tahini being yeah. like that's really the important. Yeah, 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 that's really important with the chickpeas uh, and a good olive oil. To be honest with you, people will put in really bad olive oil, and that can really make it taste horrible. So I recommend using a nice table top olive oil, not a cooking olive oil. Um, I have, a, can I say something real quick on that note? Yeah. Like, so that's one of, uh, Otto Lenghi's things is he does these, I forget what it's called Mediterranean cooking, but it's like tapas basically. Yeah. And one is hummus, but the one 
the lesson before that is mind blowing. It's the simplest thing ever. And we call it tomato crack because <laughs> it's four things. It's, to, it's fine tomatoes, garlic, um, good olive oil and salt. And you take the tomatoes and grate them. Oh, this is which, a Spanish dish. Yeah, no, there's I a know. Spanish place yeah. here that I now know that's kind of what they were doing. It's pan con tomate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, but you, and then you drain the excess fluid, and then I just kind of do it by eye, but like olive oil, salt, and then chop up some garlic. Oh man, it is. It's delicious, it, right? It might be the best thing I've ever had in my life. There's a place here. Um, yeah. Do you know? Um, it's called Wine Belly. At first. Yeah. Oh was, yeah. Absolutely. They had this like tomato bread, which is where I and I I'm, I haven't been there for a while. I haven't been anywhere for a while, but like <laughs> I. Uh, we I used to get that all the time there. I think that's kind of what they do now that I know how to do this. But a lot uh, of tapas places will do that that dish. And in fact, in Spain, depending on where you are, they won't put garlic. And it, and it's uh, a very it's a breakfast dish. Yeah, it's something you eat in the morning. Uh, in fact, I keep I keep tomato that you're talking about like that shred yeah. like in my fridge all the time. So I have some right now in my fridge like that, ready to go. Uh, all I do is toast bread and put it on. Yeah. Well, you know, it's as simple. How long does it keep? It It seems to get like kind of funky after like four or five days. Yeah. About four or five days. Depends on how good your tomatoes are when you start it. Right. The olive oil will help keep it, keep it fresh. I actually use a ton of olive oil. So mine's very, mine's very uh, olive oil driven. You know, my wife is from Spain. I lived in Spain a long time. She has her ways of doing those things. So I learned from her and from living there, like, you know, that, that particular way. So do you know, um, military. do you know Buenos Aires on the east side here? Uh, no, oh, uh, I haven't even heard of it. Oh, next time you're here, um, it's on like East Seventh. It's you just go downtown. I'm on the south yeah. side. Go downtown and over just across the highway on a uh, Waller Street, I think, or somewhere around yeah. there. Okay. Um, it they have this thing called Canelones Casaras, which is it's like Canelones. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure you know what yeah. they call. Uh, but which are great and they're filled with spinach and cheese but their chimichurri it's like you i always order like they have little like cups of it i always order like six of them you know they give you (laughs) one it is so good man it is it's mine i mean you gotta go make a note absolutely yeah I'm, i'm always uh i'm glad you i was gonna have you at the very end have you shout out some of your favorite places there in austin so that'll be one of them uh for well, sure. yeah i'll shout out to i have another one in mind too yeah right? yeah for sure we're, we're always looking to you know support those businesses so for sure <laughs> um okay um next next word here i mean next question real quick yeah. what what two words were combined to make the word spam oh well i'm assuming one's ham uh i have no idea man you're it's close you got obvious. one well it's, that's no, it's not it's not i actually didn't know this so is this it? is me this is me learning too spiced ham you were right oh, about the that. ham yeah spiced ham i i didn't know that actually i i, yeah. I didn't know that um okay oh that, that one seems a little if if something is described as rotisserie what has it been cooked on well you know, it's been what put on a. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, would you settle for spit? I can't. Think yes, of the okay. that's the word I was looking for. Okay, yeah, I was yeah, looking for yeah. the word. Well, anyway, yeah, yeah, okay. No, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you ordered an omelet, Arnold Bennett, what fish would you find in it? Um, uh, I'm gonna go with no idea and say trout. No haddock. It's- Oh, uh, all right. Well, you can I mean, that's a, t- that's a tough, yeah, you can. Yeah. Have <laughs> all Where right. This, this, the- stuff, man? this is, <laughs> it gets sent to me. It gets sent to me. Okay. Last question. You got yeah. this. This is all you. You're a Texan. You should know wow. this. What is the hottest part of a chili? Oh, well, the membrane, I guess, unless you want seeds. I mean, but it's seeds in the membrane are the hottest, aren't they? Yes, but also, yeah, yeah, I will take that. That that is the correct thing. But also, the very tip of a pepper is always the hottest. Oh, I didn't know that. I wouldn't have gotten that. Um, yeah, they never tell you that. They always say the membrane, like cut that part this, out and get the seeds out. Correct. 
the the membrane is not the spicy part but it's bitter yeah. but the uh -oh. seeds are yeah, the seeds yeah. are spicy but as far as like the skin goes the very tip of it is always where the heat is and in fact there are peppers called um uh shishito peppers oh yeah I, mean, I love those right, right yeah so they say right like it's based off of a dish they'll serve them based off of a spanish dish called pimientos de padron uh -huh. which which is the same style that they get that they serve the shishito peppers in because they can't get those peppers but basically the the trick is right they say one in every six or seven is hot so you bite the tip to see if it's hot or not right that's the that's the trick that's why they tell you to do that can you anyway. explain because i love those and i think i'm actually having those tonight but like i will eat like say i eat 20 of them yeah you don't need to explain why the 20th one's always the hot one but why <laughs> is that that it's one out of six or seven or what do you know the science behind that no i mean i'm sure it's just the way it grows and you know genetically something with the with the actual uh pepper um it's just random uh, yeah huh. I, I why i that's a good that's actually you know what i'm gonna find out you got me curious i i don't hey, know get, why. get your next guest on that one Pretend yeah like absolutely forever <laughs> what are you yeah. talking i do that every podcast i act like i've known this stuff forever well you have to man you have to when you're doing this gig <laughs> yeah i love it hey you did great you did wow. great you crushed it these aren't yeah. easy i put you on the spot so you well, cool, man. Um, well, listen, Brian, this was awesome, man. I'm, you know, uh, so excited for this, um, you know, this book to come out. I know it's still, you know, a little over a month out uh, from coming out, but, you know, glad you're getting out and getting the word out. And we'll, of course, uh, keep spreading the word on this um, on this book and and excited to have have you come on again, man, for whatever other project you got uh, coming on or if you just want to talk. I don't know music or something you have an idea for something you want to chat about I'm, I'm always down to uh have a good conversation cool yeah hit me up too whenever you know and i appreciate awesome. you doing this today to help and spread the word about the book i mean I, I rely on not just stuff like this but literal like word of mouth just people telling sure. people because that's how it that's how the more obscure stuff gets out there really but uh yeah it's been fun man oh and let me tell you if i can i wanted to make sure i don't know this dude but also next time you're in town, go to the new HEB by um, Slaughter and South Congress. It's a new big one. Like with the, and they have like a barbecue restaurant and everything. Oh yes, they were building it right. Uh, they finished it right before I moved. Yeah, yeah. And it's um, the fishmonger dude there at HEB of all places. Like I love HEB, bro. I'm a huge HEB fan. No, I am too, but you would like this guy, the, the guy who works at the fish counter, I just started talking like we were talking now and he was yeah. just throwing stuff back at me. He worked under, I can't remember who, but a couple of chefs I know in New York and, and one in Napa, but it wasn't Thomas Keller, but it was somebody else. I'm like, this dude has this massive resume. We just sat there and talked for like almost this long, just about fish. I'm just saying wow. it's a rare pleasure to go into it. You would think it would be Whole Foods or something, you know, yeah, like where, for sure. They, but it's just your regular old HEB and this dude knows everything there is to know. I don't know what his name is, so I can't say, you know, whatever, but Jeremy, know. we'll call him Jeremy. Good job, Jeremy. I'm sure he would answer to it, man. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I love that. Oh, real quick before we go, let's yeah. speak it of places in Austin. That's what, you know, shout out some other place. If there wasn't a place you, you didn't mention that you wanted to um, get well, give him some love here. I wanted to mention Buenos Aires basically because that's it's far and away. Like it's the way I always talk about towns. To me, there's towns and there's other songwriters. You know, yeah. it's like, <laughs> and in town, that's the place. But also, um, this isn't really a newsflash. They've been around, but uh, uh, Vespio and Anateca and yeah. the place on South Congress, I, I dig them. Um, honestly, like I said, I really haven't gone out. Like we favored some stuff, but like yeah. I like cooking most of the time anyway. So like. Awesome. just kind of hold up during the pandemic and uh i kind of forgot what's out there and when every time <laughs> i drive up lamar i live down at william cannon and, and manchac and every time i go up lamar it looks different i swear to god every like three days there's something new coming in yeah so yeah. in the past two years with everything closing down and opening i don't have the best read on the landscape all i know is i don't go north of sixth street if i can help it man i just <laughs> I, 
But that, that, that was that, me too. That, that Trader that Joe's too. that that's at the uh, Sea Home. It's like right by the river. Yeah, that's as far as I, I don't like crossing the river because me neither. I'm cranky me after neither. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never, I never went past the river, man. I lived on. Uh, well, I lived in many places in Austin, but the last place I lived for a few years, I was at Ben White and South Congress, basically. Yeah. Right, right behind Big Ben Park over there, where that Texaco is off South Congress, right there. Yeah. The little the houses back there. Anyway, yeah, I'm same as you. I basically was just in that area. I, I mean, I stayed south, didn't go south. The only time I used to go up north is when I had the food truck, and I used to have to go to Restaurant Depot all the way up uh, yeah. 35 uh, north, like 30 minutes nightmare absolutely there's two austins to me you know in my opinion anyway yeah there's ours and then there's theirs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly <laughs> i like yeah. that i like how you said that that's funny awesome brian well listen man i i wish you uh the absolute best uh hope you have the best rest of the day today and my best to you and your family just staying safe uh you know during this time i know it's still a little crazy with COVID and everything so you know my best to you guys and please stay safe out there and again thank you so much for taking the time today to do this and and we'll reach back out again man we'll send an email when all this is yeah is, cool. uh, ready to go the episode and everything sounds good yeah i appreciate it thanks for doing this awesome brian all right brother we'll talk to all you right. soon all right take it easy man okay later all right and now it's time for my favorite part of the show the end credits this is everyone responsible for making the show happen. Executive producer, Sebastian Sauerborn. Podcast manager, Nevena Ponovich. Marketing manager, Caroline Grape. Video and audio editors, Danilo Vojnov and Pavel Sebastianovic. Thumbnail designer, Marco Vukovic. Social media manager, Ursa Rusman. Guest outreach, Corey Menciez. Designing image quotes, Jay Apuya. Social media videos, Labri Fernandez. Outreach support, Yonet Del Mundo. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time, 